This is Comic Picks by The Glick. Yeah, I'm your host, Jason Glick. Hey, The Glick, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, John, and you know why? Why? Because I get to talk about a series that I've been wanting to talk about for most most of this year. And what's that series, sir? This is called um, Ajin Demi-Human, a series that, if you look on look on the blog, it's like you'll notice I've written up reviews of every single volume of like of this title, like every like all the previous 16 volumes have their own individual review because this is a series that while not being wholly objectively good most of the time, it has nevertheless been interesting to write about. What's the series about you ask? Well, it's about this. Um, it's about basically our world where these things called them um, demi humans exist. They're basically like unkillable ver- versions of humans that are capable of like, that you know, like aside from being unkillable, they've also got the ability to um, bring out these these entities called them um, IBMs or invisible black matter. It's like basically they're they're like kind of like, hum, like humanoid um, puppets that the that the user that the demi human can control, like like to a certain extent. But and so like this, it's like uh, this ability along with their general un, unkillability has made has made um, these demi humans a subject of of much hate and fear in the it's like in the world world at large it's like it's it's very it's very x X x-men-esque for the most like for the most part and since you've got this like these like these uh human like these um these these people find out they're not human but they've got like abilities that are you know extraordinary and that's basically made them like you know like the targets of the like of the world at large through no no direct action of their own um all of this stuff is just um, of no concern to our protagonist when you introduced him in the first volume, um, K. Nagai. He's just your average high school student, like concerned with studying, so like, I can get through his getting through his final exams, since so I can get into a good college at some some point. Up until the point in the first volume where he's hit, where he's hit by a truck, and um, you figure, well, like so much for him. Until shock of all shockers, he turns out to be a demi-human after he resurrects on the spot. And well, that's the end of his normal life. As everyone like looks at him as he gets up and says, "Like wow, it's like he's a demi-human now. Maybe we could turn him into the government for some for some quick cash." Yep, this is like a very very class classy um classy world and vision of Japan that we're that we're looking at for this for this series. And and the one thing that saves um like K from like a like from this this ignominious fate is the fact that he's that um his his um old old friend um um Kai it's like um step, steps in and saves him from the people from the people chase, chasing him after he runs after he flees the, the uh, scene of the accident and so the so the, the series then she you know starts out as being like you know a standard like shonen adventure it's like that you know it's, it's like that that could have come from the pages of shonen jump were not for the fact that that is a shueisha publication and ajin is published by um by crosstown rival kodansha and um, it's it's like, and this first volume basically the, um, does does like does the work of like set of um like of of I uh, of um like setting up like K, like K's K struggle and his like you know and the reluctant his reluctant resumption of his friend friendship with Kai and also the fact that there are other people out out there at, like actual demi humans who are like they're fighting against the uh, like the government's plan. There's um like there's Sato. Um, the, uh, the the beanie headed um, um, closed eyed um, combat veteran and Tanaka, who is you know portrayed as like his slightly unstable, creepy second second in command, and you figure that they're gonna be up at some point, and it's like eventually like you know start start the fight back against the evil, it's like like the evil government forces that seek to exploit demi humans to their like to their own ends. Well, and that's that's kind of. Wh- that's kind of worth, worth how the series starts off, but the, here's the thing about Ajin. Um, the first volume credits um, actually has two different credits to it: a story by um, writer Tsunia Mirura and um, art by um, by Gamon Sakurai. Now, as it's like as um, Sakurai um, illustrate um, spells out for us at the in his afterward to the final volume, um, Mirura didn't stick around as as the writer, and he and he soon found him and Sakurai himself. Um, found himself like you know writing the uh, the, the series as a like as a whole. So from from here on out, it's basically him, basically like you know 
working with what he what he was given in the first like in the first volume and then it's like you know dragging it in a direction that that he wanted like wanted it to go which is why the uh it's like the act you'll see like in some in the volumes that follow it's like like the action becomes more it's like you know, more more visceral more it's like more grounded basically it's like the uh it's like the fight the fighting in here is like it's basically a whole lot of a lot of gunplay with a lot of um creative uses of like you know how how do you fight when um someone how, how does like an immortal person fight you know especially when they can just like you know like reset their body just by um by shooting themselves in, in the head uh so, um sato um will, sh will show us that there's a lot of um a lot of clever and bloody stuff you can do to like to win a battle if you're willing to just you know, treat treat your body as a very as a very inex as a very expendable resource when you've got got that a bit like got the ability to, to um die and come back whenever it's like whenever you want or it's like whenever you um whenever whenever you die you can just res resurrect in like a um, in a pristine fashion but um the problems with the uh with with the early volumes is that he's kind of He's kind of he struggles with the idea that you know he wants to have like K um pre presented as like like as a generally uh you know friendly and like you know it's like a, a really personable character early on it's like because even though it's like he's like he's he at one point um is captured by the government forces and is and is tortured and experimented on like for for a week it's like when he when he's uh, rescued by by Sato and Tanaka, um, he he basically like asks him, "No, please don't don't kill kill them." Even though it's like like this does not seem like to be like a fairly reasonable um, like like stance for someone who's just like ex experienced that level of like that it's like it's like that level of um, of torture. It, in fact, it kind of feels like at this point like he's like he's trying he's he's still stuck between like you know keeping like like Kai, like a, as a, uh, as a standard, like, you know, um, shown, shown protagonist as someone who's just, you know, gonna do the right thing no matter what. But at, but at the same time though, it's like he, as the volumes go on, we get to see him like portray K as more of a, um, um, ruthless pragmatist, someone who just, someone who wants, like, who's like, you know, perfectly fine with like, you know, manipulating people and, um, just doing what doing what needs to be done. It's like, and that, this would this would be fine if if it weren't for the fact that you know it's like this kind of feels it feels like he's just trying to you know like like Sakurai is just kind of trying to retcon it's like like K's like K's mentality into being like this is the way it always was. It's like even if like you know it's like it just doesn't feel it doesn't feel right. It's like, but that's less of an issue. Then the fact that that um Ajin, well, Ajin is kind of a special series because it's probably the first series I've read in a long time, if not ever, where I have fully um like empathized with the uh, with the antagonist over the protagonist, the protagonist and his friends, because he's got because like K gets get some friends, he even like teams up with like a with a, a less um, corrupt version of the, uh, it's like less corrupt, um, like a side of the government or like their anti demi demi human um, task force to uh, like to um, basically to bring Sato in because here's the thing about Sato, um, when you get when when um, he's first properly introduced to K, it's like he's basically like you know pitching him on the idea of like you know we've got to fight, it's like like we got to like you know like show no mercy to these people and so you think okay. In this, like, you know, very X Men esque story, it's like he's the Magneto character. He's the um, ends justifies. He's got the ends justifies the means type type of thinking, and you know that's perfectly fine. Well, at least it is until like like the uh, series goes on, and then you find out that well, Sato is much more of a is much more of a fighter, much more of a killer than initially like seems, especially when you find out his. Um, his quote unquote origin as we found out what he was like as a kid and his background in working with um US special forces like in like back in Vietnam. So that's it's like and it basically makes you think that okay, this guy, he's not really the Magneto type. He's just kind of more of like a straight up killer than anything else. Now, some people 
um, a lot of people, I imagine a lot of people aren't going to be able to like to um, rationalize this away. But the thing is, for me, Sato's actions um, resonate in a way that I that he's like a character type that I've seen in a lot of um, like in a lot of works by um, by Garth Ennis. Um, Ennis um, has written like you know lots of war comics, lots of Punisher comics as well, and um, there's a character that turns up a, a lot of times in his work, and this is the character. This is and this is the guy who is having too much fun to quit basically the, the person who like who loves um like killing it's like and it's just like you know likes likes fighting in wars because like this is the person he was born to be it's like and he just wants to you know keep fighting wars because you know this is what gives gives his life meaning um his take on nick fury like in, like is one in the punish in the punisher max universe is one it's like is one such example um it's like his one of his uh, more stories, um, the main, one of the main characters in, in the Reavers comic was also a good ex example of this as well. But see, that's basically what Sato is here. Sato is the guy who's having too much fun fun to quit. It's like, and it's also like um, explained through his like his gaming, his identification, identification with, like with gaming as well, because guy is shown to be like a big, big time gamer, it's like like um, playing lots of lots of handheld games, making lots of Mario Mario refer references as well. It's like, and it's, it's like, and I can understand that, but it's also interesting to see that he, that he's basically attached himself um, to the one fight that is never going to end. Basically the fight for civil rights, because like you said, he's framing his, his, all of his fighting through the, uh, through the um, lens of like, oh, we want demi-human representation. It's like, we want like our, our, our people to be represented and the government has been like, has has been lying to you and is like secretly ex experimenting on us. And you figure, and that's kind of, that's really interesting. That's, it's, it's interesting to see like, you know, like this, this straight up killer just basically like, you know, using um, like the fight for civil rights as his excuse to fight a war that is, that is effectively never going to end. Now, Sakurai kind of undercuts this a bit as, as things goes on because, well, Saito also has a key, has an Achilles heel as a character in the sense that, you know, he's, also, he, he's he's kind of he's kind of bored easily as well, so it's kind of like once he realizes like you know things like this fight like you know it's just gonna like, kind of be the same same kind of battles over and over. It's like he needs to uh, like he needs to, like um fight find a way to keep things interesting in order to uh, it's like in order for him to keep fighting. Well, and that's where um K comes in because he's the first um demi human to really present a uh, a challenge for him to like to, to fight against and but the thing is though that um k it's like uh like k's mindset as well as the other um um it's like, it's like demi -human, anti demi human forces it's like and the other demi humans he teams up with well they're not exactly it's like you know the sharp sharpest tools in the shed i mean there's there's tosaki who's like the uh initially like the uh like the government agent who's set to uh, track, like you know, track K down and bring him in, but eventually winds up you know, working with him in order to, um, like bring, I uh, bring Sato and his crew down once and for all. There's um, see, there's Ko, like a uh, like a like a, like a kid who's kind of like a um, like drifting day worker who initially um tries, um, meets up with Sato like after he like makes his own plea to uh, get uh, bring all demi humans like on his side and find. But then he finds out that no, no, this guy's bad news. I don't want to work with him. He's kind of a, uh, he's kind of like a dumb, like you know, more of a street smarts than book smarts kind, kind of guy. But um, he eventually work, winds up working with K after K decides to let him out of the uh, trailer. He's trapped, trapped him in because you know, at this point, the point in the story, they encounter them, each other. K is living incognito in the, uh, it's like in in the boonies and. Um, like in Ko's appearance, just um, like those wrench into his like you know plan to live in blissful like anonymity. It's like and there's also um like Izumi um Tosaki's uh, demi human um right it's like right hand uh, or right hand person. It's like she's like it's interesting to, like to hear about to hear about her like her backstory, which is you know like drenched in tragedy, but still. But but still pretty rendered pretty effectively in the in one of the few um series that doesn't it few parts of the series that doesn't involve extended gunfire it's like but and so it's it's kind of and so it's interesting to see like you know why she would work with sosaki but also you know what like 
it make but it makes sense as well. And that's again that's also that's also appreciable. And then there's Tanaka who like I said, it's he, he was initially presented as like, you know, like a um, lip pulling like um crazy person, but um then he but he's eventually um rendered as, as basically someone who is, you know, like loyal to to, to um Sato for getting him out of the uh, bad situation he was in, but eventually like, you know, realizing that he's like that he may not have like everyone's best interest in mind in his, in his, um, that his mindset is, um, is more, is further altered when, um, he has an encounter with, um, Izumi's um, IBM. Cause one of the things that's established here is that if, um, IBM's from different, um, demi humans collide, then they're, it's like, then they can share memories between their hosts as well. Yeah. But, but as things, but as things go on, it's like, the uh, the problem is that that um K K's group is just you know generally um not very good at fighting at fighting off Sato. Sato is just like a one one man war war machine. It's like and he's also got his like his his group like including Tanaka and some other like like um like like minded demi humans as well like like to back him up. And it's like and there and, and honestly it's more fun to see them just you know run. Just you know, just run roughshod over like over K's group because K's group is just kind of kind of boring and dull in the sense that you know we're going to fight like you know fight the good fight because we're you know, just because like you know we're like we understand like you know Sato is like Sato's a bad guy and all and all but the thing is like you know Sato Sato is clearly enjoying himself because because he's having because even because in the parts where he can bring himself to engage in it's like in in combat it's it's a lot of a lot of fun to see because he's also like very clever about using his demi human abilities um to their fullest and in very very creative ways in order to it's like it's like in order to defeat his, his opposition these 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 bits range from tying a tourniquet to his arm to use to use his arm as a as a shield when someone tries to fire a tranquilizer into it um throwing himself into a wood chipper in order to allow him to um resurrect at a point where um, a larger part of his um, corpse has been has been mailed to, or um, just um, flying, it's like um, like stealing planes from a from a base and using them to, and flying them into um, various important government buildings across across Japan in order in order to make make his point about demi human rights, which not really, but it's like hey, it's like you know whatever whatever makes him happy at this point, it's. Like I said, it's basically he's the guy who is clearly enjoying himself. He's having fun, and it's like, it's like, and compared to like the um, the main cast, which is just just for her, just dumb like shonen. They're following like the dumb shonen um like you know play playbook in the sense that you know we're going to do this because you know we know it's the right thing to do, and also the power of friendship definitely um comes into play here, um more more often than not. It's like that's. I mean, I'm at the point where it's like, you know, it's not that the um, power of friendship can't work for me. It's just that you need to do it in more ways that are more interesting than what what this series serves up. And one and the thing is, like, the only the series only like really it's it's most legitimate, um, like a uh, strength is the uh, is the um constant um are the action sequences that Sakurai serves up over the course of this course of the series. He's got a great um sense um like sense of sense of place sense of perspective. It's like and just general weight to the uh like to the fight to the fight scenes here. In the sense they come off grounded, grounded and believable, even as like you know we're dealing with like some fantastic sub subject matter here. It's like it's it's always fun when it, the series is always at its strongest when it's just like you know seeing Sato and his crew like you know fight against the. Uh, it's like the opposition and just like tear tear them to shreds because even when they're doing this it's like even though you know they're going to win there's usually like a, some genuine creativity to the way that he that's being done here because Sato has found some way to uh like to use his um his his abilities in new new and interesting manner in a new and interesting manner it's so like so like i said it's like whenever like the bullets are flying the series you can shut your brain off and enjoy the series like as it is whenever more, more often than not, when the characters like are just you know talking about you know how we're gonna get this guy, it's just kind of like yeah you know this is 
dumb. It's like, and I kind of wish like Sato would just, you know, win and win, kill them all. It's like, and then go off to a, like to a nice tropical island to retire, which, you know, it's like, I kind of hope that was going to happen as the series reached its climax um, in the last couple volumes, because I thought it was going to end like in volume 16, but he just, but um, Sakurai decided to spin his we- spin his wheels for a while and like, and just stretch things out as long as humanly possible. Um, while offer also offering up the origin of demi humans, it's like in volume, in volume sixteen. I thought it was um, some awful wheel, um, wheel spin, wheel spinning, but um, but it also meant that okay, we're just gonna wait that much longer for volume seventeen, the finale, which, at the time I'm recording this, um, arrived, arrived at my place um, about five five days ago, and it starts off with a, a long conversation between um, K and Co. Um, back when they were um, leaving their, um, like, like the rural area that um, K was hiding out in, but also like him talking, K talking to uh, Ko about, you know, the proper way to jump into water without passing out. Um, I'm mentioning this because uh, if I were a betting man, it's like I, um, I would assume that these pages were actually added into the uh, final volume um, in a, uh, it's like in the way that you know, like some some mangaka will try to add, like we'll we'll add in pages in order once they've um, it's like once they're like prepping the final prepping a volume for for serialization. I've heard of lots of volumes being um, it's like um like being re- um retrofitted in, like in this fashion. Like the descript- the idea is like the uh, ser- the um magazine serialization is the live is the live show. It's like in the uh, it's like in the um. Co- the, um, in the final volume is the uh, it's like it's like is the um studio recording so but um this is but the thing is because like this this like, con- these conversations between um k um k and co turns out to be pretty relevant to the uh to the action of the fi- uh, to the climax of the final volume which for the most part you know starts off in um pretty pretty standard fashion as it's like as the uh, as a flood of um K's IBMs had been st- that had started in um volume fifteen, um like finally pe- peters out here, and Sato um, and while this this is going on, Sato um finally makes his way to. So, um Sato's um IBM like who's been flying a uh, helicopter to help get his um host out of here, it's like finally um touches down on a, it's like on an embankment across across the river, so. Sato is has just about gotten away um, from the like from all the forces I'm um, pursuing him, but um, but the thing is though that um, K um, well dogged um, protagonist that he is has finally tracked um, Sato down and is looking to um, finally have like this one final um, final chance to stop him. As far as um, what happens, you know. I, on one hand, it's like, I can, I, I can understand, um, you know, what, like, the, Sato's actions actually make a certain kind of sense, as we've established the fact that he's someone who is, like, you know, fighting against, like, well, is fighting against boredom, it's like, even as he uses, like, you know, the, uh, like, the whole civil rights thing as an excuse to keep fighting, but his real fight like, is against boredom. So when he sees Kai, you know, looking for that final fight, well, he's, he wants to give it to him, and, well, you know, it's like, I, I want to, uh, I guess I do want to kind of avoid spoilers here, but let's just say that if I was reading this and I had still any sympathy for the protagonists, it's like, and the way things turned out here, I probably would have thought that, nope. It's like this. What happens here is like, is it enough for me to convince that they were like in the right, or that they you were, were really ultimately more clever than the than the, than the uh, it's like the, than the bad guy. Really, the only way, like um, um the, the success they have against um Sato here is only down to the fact that you know, like his overcon his overconfidence and some blind blind luck um basically pay, pays off for them so it's kind of like i'm just kind of like mildly disappointed in the f- fact that ah well sato you you should have yeah yeah 
I can see why you did this, but yeah, you just kind of push your luck, luck too far. And in the end, it's like the ma majority of this volume is given over to it's like 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 to the falling action as we find out just you know what happens to to everyone as the uh, it's like as the uh, it's like as the fight as the fighting is over and um, they've all got and everyone gets tries to get back to live like living a life for lack for lack of a better term it is bog standard is what you as, as you expect from a shonen series and I didn't. And there really weren't any surprises. It's like, like, like in the end, um, the most interesting part of the final volume was, uh, it's like was Sakurai's af afterward, where he talks about the uh, the changes from like working with the original writer to taking over the writing himself, and also just talking about how he was in, it's like he has a he has a love of like American action movies of the late eighties, early nineties, and um, and how he just tried to. Like you know, make that like abundantly clear in his, it's like in his writing. So it was interesting to read about the, uh, it's like his hit thoughts on the series and like these these additional insights were fun, but it was also one page, and it can't quite um, you know overcome the fact that you know this is a longer than usual volume. It just basically um, wraps up in a way that's you know about what you'd expect and very conventional, very predictable as far as like you know shown shown in action goes. Yes, it's some bloodier than usual shown in action, but not in the uh, like fun, creatively dumb ways that something like say Chainsaw Man is. So, in the end, um, Ajin, it's like I say, it was it was interesting to write about and for me to like to ponder. It's like you know, just where the hell is he going with this? Or like you know, what this seems like a goddamn mess. How is he going to make this work? Kind of way. So, and I like. And as a as a reviewer, as a critic, I like that. I like I like you know like you know pouring over these volumes just to see like you know what's what's going to happen here. Is it finally become legitimately interesting, or is it going to become just like a goddamn train train wreck where everything's on fire um, most of the time? It never quite became either, which is kind of disappointing. But at the same time, it's like it's it's unevenness. It's like it's lack of cohesion. Like still, still had me invested in seeing how it was going to tur turn out in the end. And if nothing else, I gotta admit, it's like if the Sakurai does decide to go back to uh, doing another series like this instead of maybe doing um, going back to um, Ero manga, which he used to do before this, and apparently he says, yeah, hey, may may go back and do this again now that he's done with um, Ajin. Well, you know, it's like I'm, like I said, I'm curious to see where he's where he's gonna go from this, but. I'll admit that I'm more interested in seeing him go go down like a they uh like a more like a more mainstream path rather than just like doing more porn comics again. But I don't know. Maybe those will be like interesting in their own ways compared compared to what we got here. So you're saying that there's um predictable on this one. That's what I thought I heard you say. Yeah, it's like there's there's a lot of predictable shown like shown bullshit here that you've seen that you've seen before if you're familiar with the works works of sh like um any series that come out of shown shown and jump but um it's definitely aimed at a more well it's the uh the um the bloodiness makes it aimed at a more like uh, older audience and like most shown and jump shown and jump titles but at the same time it doesn't have any like uh depth um to its storytelling that would that would really mark it as a like, a genuinely good seinen title okay well there so, you go well, that's yeah. cool it's more. I think it's probably like more appreciated by people who who can appreciate like a um, good potential train wreck than anything else. <laughs> that's what it sounds like, <laughs> pretty much. Ah, oh, well, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of to be expected, I guess. I mean, you know, we had talked about um, we had talked about um, uh, Squid Game and how it was like, well, it's predictable, but it was executed well, right? So there's some differences there between like how you know it's like if you're just following for the same tropes and you're just kind of rewriting them and there's not, you know, maybe that's kind of what you're thinking, uh, you know. Yeah, I see what you're saying there about the about the execution. Um, the execution in this series really only works when bullets are flying. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so there's, so I guess there's, there's that right there. 
Cool. All right. So this being the last podcast of 2021, wait, really? We're at the end of the year already. <laughs> what does where that did mean the time for next go? time? Yeah, where did the time go? What does that mean for what are you gonna what are you gonna be talking about next time? Okay, well, it's like there's one series that I do want to talk about before I dive into the best of the year because I imagine like this this one series that involves a certain certain green Goliath um, is is going to like um, force its way onto the best best of list. I want to give it its due before that happens. But before that can actually happen, well, it's like I've actually got to get my hands on the volume and I need to um, get in touch with Rob about do, joining us for that. But before that, um, well, it's like. Our buddy Steve um, may be joining us for the next for the next podcast as I talk about a series that I caught up on like over the past year and that actually got its own anime adaptation at the same time. Um, to Your Eternity from a silent voice writer, um, Yoshitoki o Oima, which um, is a 12-volume series. That's right, only 12 volumes. And Steve and I will be talking about those only 12 volumes um, next time, if everything goes right. All right. And we'll catch you next time on Comic Picks by the Glip. All right. Laters. <laughs>